sorry, I'm I'm not that late. Come on. I was I'm gonna blame everybody in the Zoom. Hi hi Debbie. How you doing? Um a DB, I'm sorry. I should put my glasses on and that would be like a lot better. Or I should probably should go to YouTube. We were showing the crazy things that Jimmy has done, like uh hoisting a, a huge chandelier up and, and installing a whirlpool. Anyway. And then Kevin said, you're late. And he said, we're late. <laughs> okay. Let's see. There I am. So tonight we're going to go through Ruby Frankie's journal. And now that I think we've gone through everything we've gone through, it's going to be more, I don't know, I think you'll be more aware of what happens because you've been in the house, you've seen the rooms, you've seen the kids' conditions, you've seen Ruby, you've seen Jody, you know, you've seen their attitudes, you've seen all of that. And now we're going to get in their head about, I think it's going to be profound about what they were planning to do because I don't have a doubt in my mind if their plan came to fruition if they got that land that they were looking to get and they were looking that's why they were putting everything in Jody's house into storage and they were selling going to sell Jody's house and she was going to invest in this land and that money she got that eighty nine thousand dollars that I believe she took out for a down payment so that they could move fast, you know, and they didn't have to wait for the house to close and all of that. They could move fast. And if that happened, they would have had this land. Hi, Sandra. Hi, everybody. Linda. Hi, uh, Kevin, DB, Ruff, Ashley, everybody. Sorry if I missed anybody. But they would have had this land and they would have put these kids at hard labor and they would, I think, have gone the Daybell route, that they were damaged beyond repair, they had demons inside of them, and they they freed them somehow, right? Because, you know, where she would get in her head that she needed to do this, but everything that we've heard, and I, and I want to look at those, um, the Hannah people, because I've looked at the Hannah people, and they have like eight kids or six kids of their own, and they have some kind of, I don't know whether it's a realty or some kind of a business, but people are worried for their kids now because, hold on a minute. Sorry. <laughs> a little crazy here. But people look at that. Good night, guys. Love you. But so they, um, what was I going to say? Those other kids, what's happening with them? If they had Jody come in their house, and now this woman, according to Kevin, is saying that Jody seduced that woman's husband, that Jody um, was stabbing herself in their house. But if Jody was originally a counselor for the kids and then got to know the parents, what might these people be doing? You know what I mean? It's scary. So where are these people? Why are they not? Are they speaking out against? Um, what is going on here with Ruby? So I'm wondering if there's going to be any testimony from them, which we haven't seen. And then there's that other lady, that Pam Boucher lady, that I want to look into more about. Well, well what happened with her? She was she was the third one, wasn't she? That was going into the room with Ruby and with Jody and spending hours and hours. And Kevin was saying, oh, they were coming out on cloud nine. Yeah, okay. So we're gonna get we're gonna look at this journal from that from this point. Now the other thing is um tomorrow I have to go to the doctor, so good thoughts on that one. I'm really worried about my some things, but we'll see. Hopefully everything will be fine. All right, let's go and pull up this stuff here. So I have her journal downloaded. Let me pull that up. Ruby, 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 Ruby. 
Redacted. Here we go. I'm probably gonna have to get a drink at some point, but let me see here. Where's my thing to make this larger? Here's my minimize. Where's my... There we go. And maybe you can see it from way over there. Okay, so we're gonna start here. Now she has, they, they've redacted this where they've redacted some of the stuff and they've used initials for the kids' names. And so we're gonna start. This starts in May of 2023. So May 21st of 2023, Jody receives a blessing from the temple president, Steve Kaplan. 522, Ruby, A, J, R, and E. R and E are the youngest two kids, okay? Then A and J are the older two, but not that they're, they're still minors. Come down to Jody's to help spring clean, okay? Spring clean, code for... Um, be abused. 52823 Meet Jeremy Jazz or Jeremy Jug. And this part is redacted, okay? So whatever they did here, they redacted this. 61323 Jody goes to Salt Lake City to meet with Jeremy Jag and Brian and Brad Wilcox. So we need to find out who they are, right? Jody's meeting with them. Then R, that's the little boy, refused by, okay, so they came down by, in the end of May, by the end of June, they are totally abusing the kids. Um, he refused to do wall sits. He says he is done. July 1st, the little boy, R is for Russell, is to stay outside, sleep outside, only come in to go to the bathroom and shower. 714. E, that's the girl, the little girl that was in the closet, refuses to work, screams, has her hair shaved off. Nice. Now, the first time the little boy ran away was July 15th. He was eventually successful at contacting help on August 30th. So this poor kid, for six more weeks after this escape attempt, he had to live this horribly abusive lifestyle. So Russell runs away around 1.15 a.m. Ruby finds him at 3.19 a.m. Jody, E and J, the little girl and one of the older girls, drive to Arizona to find property, land. See, they knew when he ran away, this is not going to work out. We need to get some property in Arizona, right? And this is completely, look at this, look at this pages and pages. Can you imagine how horrific this is, that this is all redacted? Look at that. And let me tell you something. Then this goes back to July 9th, Okay. That's a little timeline. Let's go to July 9th. This is before he ran away. Sunday. So on July 10th is this little boy's birthday. So five days later, he ran away on July 15th. You get it? R turns 12 tomorrow. I never envisioned him being 12. Still pooping and peeing himself. Satanic choices lead one to becoming destitute, even in the most affluential homes. Oh, okay. Maybe he's destitute, right? July 10th, this is his birthday. Monday, it's R's birthday. He doesn't even know what month it is. So this kid doesn't even know what month it is, and she's seeming like 
that's a good thing. E and R have been in so much deviant behavior, they won't control their bodily functions. They are both furious. Their selfish, sinful lifestyle is being intervened upon. I told R, he emulates a snake. He slithers and sneaks around looking for opportunities when no one is watching. And then he scurries. If he wants to emulate the Savior, he needs to be 100% obedient with exactness, no wavering, no hiding. And meantime, right, her and Jody were the ones that were lying, not living in the truth, right? She said herself, Jody's going to lie, all that stuff. Okay, our lies, I mean all the time. He is a compulsive liar. I never would have suspected this entire experience is a shock to my system. I never would have... Okay. I've... Hold on, wait. Shocked him. I never would... It... I don't... Something suspected the cold, dead heart. Look at that. The cold, dead heart R has. Nowhere to look. He has always been able to get what he wants. And now that he can't, he is furious. I told him if he divulged everything, he would automatically begin repenting. I asked if there was... All redacted. Look at this. Must be horrific. I told R that he needs food. I invited him. That, excuse me. That he needs God. I invited him to fast and pray. R is in and out of possession. Okay. Meaning that he's in and out of being possessed by something. By a demon is what she's trying to say. He is workable. Calm for a bit and then angry, defiant the next. The only consistent thing about R is that he lies. And then she says, E is better behaved with Jody. She likes to think she can still manipulate me. I gave her a pixie haircut. All her long hair is gone. Look at how she's loving that. No more distracting with hair. Well, her, what about uh, Ruby's long hair? That should be gone, right? No more distracting with hair, which is what, exactly what she does. 7-11-23. Big day for evil. Now, this is the day after his birthday. E manipulates me. That's the little girl in the closet. She won't scream when Jody is around, but with me... She wails all night. E screamed, cried, and would hit her head on the floor. Today, Jody confronted her. E admits to putting on a show for her mother. E says she wants to be pitiful. R was told to stand in the sun with his sun hat. He is defiant. No. I told him a couple more times. R, or I should say... His demon stays in the shade. I push R into the sun. R comes back. I come back with a cactus poker. When I poke his back to get in the sun, R doesn't even flinch. I poke him on the neck. He is in a trance and doesn't appear to feel anything. Jody taps him on the cheeks to wake him up. The devil doesn't like when you get your subject to anger, to truth. R, do you know I love you? Yes, ma'am. R, do you know G. Joe loves you? That's, that's what they call Jody, okay? Yes, ma'am. R, do you know the Savior loves you? Yes, ma'am. R, wants out of his, his outcomes. After our talk, R stays in the shade. I take my old mop water and go to R. I show 
the R the water. Then I pour the water on R. It's hot outside. It feels good, doesn't it? Yes. The old mop water. Okay. An hour later, G. Joe takes R on a little work, excuse me, a little walk to the pool. She talks on how R has love twisted. If R likes something someone does, he calls it love. If he doesn't, he thinks it's not loving. G. Joe then pushed R into the pool. R swam to the side. G. Joe pulled him out. Feel good? Refreshing? Yes, ma'am. I went out a couple of hours later and asked if he wanted the pool again. Yes, ma'am. Will you let me push you in? R laughed. Then tried not to act too excited. R cooled off and went back to his spot. I put my hands on his face. R, have you ever heard someone talk underwater? Yes, ma'am. I know R is in there somewhere. I know deep down under all this anger, you can hear me. It may sound like I'm underwater with you, but hear me, I love you. R got teary. Then I put my hand tightly over his nose and mouth. Tightly? She put her hand tightly over his nose and mouth. What? He couldn't breathe, right? I am coming to you in this water, putting my hands on your nose and mouth. The devil lies and says, I'm hurting you, abusing you. But R, what am I really doing? Look at her chain, okay? She says that when she's suffocating him, the devil lies and says that she's hurting him and abusing him. But what am I really doing? She's freaking with this kid's head, right? You are putting oxygen on me to help me breathe. Yes, that's right. How is, she's not putting oxygen on him. She's cutting his oxygen off. R looked like he wanted to beat me up this morning and then he was intrigued interested and then two hours later he drinks water from the hose steals water R is compulsive he feels no remorse for his choices he shuts down and says he wants to go to jail R says he worships the devil and has no interest in changing Something. What does that say? I want the outcome of being. I want the outcome of being changed, but I don't want to do the work that it requires. R doesn't actually know what jail means. He has no comprehension what throwing your life away means. Isn't that ironic, though? But who ends up in jail? Jody and Ruby, right? Now they, they have comprehension of what jail means. He just wants the immediate gratification of sitting in an air, conditioning, an air conditioning car ride to the juvie. He wants stimulus. No, that's what you got, right? That's what you got, didn't you? R is so back and forth. R stole water. He was angry and looked like he wanted to fist up. I put my hands on his shoulders and told him I love him. I told him he has no idea what he's doing, but I do. I can help him. I told him, give your demon friend a message for me. I will not rest. I will not stop. I will not leave. I win. I will, excuse me, I will fight him until the day you die. Now listen to that. I will fight him until the day you die. See, she's already going to outlive the 12 year old little boy. Well, how is she going to outlive him? Right? Yeah. Not till the day she dies, until the day you die. I have the power of God, and he must obey. See, she's, she's putting herself with the power of God. I beat Satan, I win. And then I looked in R's eyes and with power authority commanded, get out now, go. 
R immediately smiled, cried, slumped, softened. He's gone. He left. I took E and R on a car drive to the Shuritz gas station. I told E she was never going home. Okay? This is abuse, right? You're never going home. Never. I showed her pictures of her on the swing under the big tree. She saw a girl who was hiding, who enjoyed tricks. I told her I saw a daughter of God with divine worth. E manipulated during the car drive. R appeared to soften. I stopped the car and we all got out to view the sunset. I told E she needs to stop her fantasy. She is not innocent. She can become innocent through repentance. Don't waste more time. R and E have been counting days. R did know yesterday didn't did know yesterday was his birthday. So she's saying he did know now. Then there's all that redacted. He told E told her figures she had been they had been there eight weeks. I asked E if she felt like she had made progress over the eight weeks. Yes. I told her she was delusional. She has made no progress. Listen to that, right? Okay, they figured out they're there. Hey, did you make no, you made nothing. She constantly beats them down, right? She's delusional. You made no progress. She continues to lie, manipulate. Last night her screaming and trance, head banging was evidence of no change. Seven twelve, we're not even at seven fifteen where he ran away. Wednesday took the kids on a nine-hour car ride. We stopped at Gunlock Lake. I shared my love for them. We watched a baby cow get loose and walk into the road in front of us. I made the analogy of the not-so-wise calf to them. I was keeping them safe when they want to run in the road. We drove up to the Vigo? I bought a volcano pie. I told the kids the pie was to thank G. Joe for her home, care, and time. R appeared engaged. E was manipulative. This is the day E anticipates breaking her two-day fast. So that child hasn't eaten for two days, and she buys this, whatever this volcano, volcano pie is which let me just check out what a volcano pie is here while we're at it let me see what a volcano pie is a volcano pie i don't know why i have a vision of what it might be but it's something with chocolate and cream okay a volcano pie if this is like what i thought it would look like Indulge in delicious volcano pie. So, it says, um, this indulgent treat features a luscious custard filling surrounded by delicious cocoa dough crust. Volcano pie. A veo. That's where she said veo. We drove up to veo. Okay, so let me see what veo is. Hold on a minute. Because I see veo volcanic pie and it looks delicious. Veo volcano pie. Okay, let's see what this is. So it's in Utah. Okay, I'll show you what this looks like. Veo pies. And these are the volcano pies.
these right here. So show, imagine, you're, you haven't eaten in two days. Now remember what they said about that little girl. She ate that entire little pizza and then she ate two more slices. She was starving. Mother buys this volcano pie. She probably wanted to eat that in the car. This is just cruel and torturous. And she says that Eve intended on breaking the fast that day, thinking that, okay, I'm going to have that pie, right? Yeah. I don't know if any of you have had this volcano pie, but it's a uh, Veo Pies. It's a small town in Utah that boasts world famous pie. I don't know if anybody has heard of this. Okay, here's the pie, and I, I don't know why. When just when she said that, I just got a vision. I've never had it, but is this this is exactly how I imagined it? Like some kind of a chocolate cream pie, and let's see, it looks like caramel or peanut butter. Let's see what it's like, okay? Because we are going to do a deep dive, like only we do here. We'll dive into everything that we read or we want more understanding about. So this is the perfect pie. It features a flaky crust. Ideal amount of filling and flavors that make your mouth water. Veo Pies is located in the small town of Veo, which is approximately 25 miles north of St. George. Population of fewer than a thousand people. There isn't much that will attract you to this small town. However, after one bite of the pies at this bakery, you'll want to visit this town over and over again. Oh, I think that other uh, gas station might be Sinclair that she talks about. So it says, let's see, I want to see what these are made of. There's an assortment of cream pies with filling that is thick and delicious. We recommend a slice or a whole pie of the Veo Volcano Pie. This pie features a graham cracker crust sweet cream cheese, butterscotch, chocolate, and a whipped cream topping. Not only do the pies taste incredible, but they are beautifully made as well. Okay, so she's getting this uh, volcano pie for Jody to thank her so much for letting her use her house, right? Okay. Let me get over here. We're going to go back to the journal. Okay, so now we know. They drove up to Veo. I bought a volcano pie. I told the kids the pie was to thank Gijo for her home care time. R appeared engaged. E was manipulative. This is the day... E anticipates breaking her two-day fast. When we get home to Gijo's, I let R know. See, this, this uh, should, I think they, whoever redacted this, they made a mistake, and this is supposed to be E, because it doesn't make sense with R. I let E know she has hardened her heart and will do one more day of fasting to invite her to humble. Okay, so you see that? I've got this volcano pie, but you know what? Hmm. You're going to fast for a third day. Can't happen. E flips out and begins ranting. Well, who wouldn't? She's starving. It's ridiculous. She refuses to get up. She lies on the floor all day speaking dishonest chants because G. Joe is on the phone with clients. I don't go in and match her level of aggression. Now look at that. I don't go in and match her level of aggression. What does that mean? Match her level means if she's sitting there screaming, that means that Ruby is sitting there and matching it and screaming back right raging at this at this kid that's starving all day e makes rhymes about my mom starves me calls it fasting you see she's thinking that 
Her daughters make no. Her daughter's telling the truth. My mother starves me. Maybe she was trying to make somebody, one of those clients that uh, G. Joe was talking about, hear this, right? My mom starves me, calls it fasting. My mom won't lift a finger and bring me food because all she does is lie on the bed and eat brownies. My mom says she is the most loving mom in the world. Blah, blah, blah. If I can't ever go home, then what's the point in being obedient? I'm going to run away. G. Joe helped me intervene after work. So after Jody was off speaking with her clients, speaking with their clients she helped me intervene right how did they intervene what did they do pattern she puts here allowing lies to be spewed gives the devil a platform articulating lies reinforces possession the longer the lies are allowed to be spewed the longer the intervention and physical the intervention needs to be. You're reading between the lines here, okay? She's saying what the child did and said was lying. But she was telling the truth about her mother. But to Jody and to Ruby, she was lying. So now, the longer that you let those lies have a platform, so, okay, you've been lying on the floor saying these lies for three hours... That means the larger the intervention and physical the intervention needs to be. Physical. Whereas Jody, from what I can see on certain podcasts, was saying, don't physically discipline kids. Doesn't sound like that's really what she lived, right? Not at all. I cut off. I cut more off E's head, okay? So the, the humiliator cut her hair again. We doused her with water in the dog wash. Now, if you remember the, the um, pictures of this place, they have a dog wash. She, bought, she doused her with water in the dog wash, probably ice cold water, okay? E said she wanted to run away. Jody told E she has no idea what is waiting for her threats. You have no idea what's waiting for you. Horrible. Can you even imagine this? They took them from their home. They showed her a picture where she was on a swing outside her home, even though that home life was not anything great, but it wasn't, I don't think, as anything like this. Then they tell her, you're not going to eat for three days. You're never going home again. This is such emotional torture. This is physical torture. This is why these people need to never be around kids again or anyone, really. Um, they belong in jail for the rest of their lives. This is the most sick, twisted, sadistic crap Um and this is supposed to be a psychologist that's, that's doing this. So think about this child being nine years old. And at nine years old being told this, you're never going home. Uh, we're going to be starving you. Uh, we're uh, you're, we're going to cut your hair off. You're not going to eat. We're going to, you know, put you in cold, do all this stuff. Remember the cactus is all of that. And then Jody says, you have no idea what's waiting for you. There's not a doubt in my mind. These children would not be alive probably in another month had that little boy not run away. That's why I think all these kids need to be checked on that we're in with them. Because if they were having, I'm sorry, they were having Jody and stuff around them, 
and they were all involved in this and they have all these kids. How do we know those kids are not being abused? All these people. Who else, like everyone else that Jody was in contact with, everybody should be checked out. Everyone should be checked out. They have nothing to hide if they're not doing anything wrong. Okay. I may have forgotten to write this. She's worried. I may have forgotten to write something. On the 11th, I took R's face in my hands and I spoke to him through something love you I told him to send the demon a message for me I will not give up I will not leave I'm I am going nowhere you get out R released the demon and he has been very workable ever since this morning the 13th R broke his fast with brown rice lentils black beans and chicken and water A hornet kept buzzing around his chicken. I told R to think of the hornet as Satan. Would you become pals with Satan? Would you sell your soul or chicken to a hornet? He will sting you in the end. R trapped the bee with his sun hat. <coughs> e broke her fast with cheesy potatoes, steak, water, oatmeal, and water. R is full of piss and vinegar. See, they don't mean R. They mean E. E is full of piss and vinegar. She's mad as a hornet. She doesn't call the shots. So they're having fun trying to, what they call, break these kids' will, right? It's sickening. 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 Okay, it's been about 90 minutes since R ate. I warned him that food would either energize him to truth or defiance. He is defiance again. He pooped his pants and telling me no. His poop is too watery to be fasting. R admits to stealing. You see, she wanted these kids dehydrated. So... She knows that he's been drinking. She's been denying them water. Even people that fast get water. But not these kids. They don't get water. Sickening. Admits to stealing water three times yesterday. That's why if you saw him sitting in the chair at the neighbor's, he was just drinking that water like crazy. R lies and feels no remorse. Why should he feel remorse to getting water that he needs to live when it's being denied from him? That's not something that should be done. They are horrible people. I really hope these kids are getting the right counseling. I, I, I really worry about them if they end up in the father's hands because... The father seems to be okay with what was done here. This is disgusting. E is cheating. These selfish, selfish children. Sounds like something out of a Joan Crawford movie. Who desire only to take, lie, and attack. Does she, there, see, there's no self-awareness in Ruby. No self-awareness. They're the selfish ones. They're the ones that have a desire to attack. They're attacking innocent children and, and lying about them and lying to them. And, and, oh my gosh, this is so disgusting. These people should not be out of prison. These selfish, selfish children who desire only to take, lie, and attack have zero understanding of God's love for them. They don't know God. Uh, Jijo is selling her home. This part, this something Snow Canyon gem, this priceless Snow Canyon gem, so she can purchase land 
where those two can work. Now just listen to that. The selfish, selfish children who desire only to take, lie, and attack have zero understanding of God's love for them. They don't know. See, she's equating, again, I think, Jijo and herself as God, you know, as it's horrible because she's talking about God's love for them and then she's talking about a sacrifice that Jijo is making supposedly for them. They don't know. Jijo is selling her home this priceless, well, it's not priceless, it has a price tag on it, Snow Canyon Gem. So she could purchase land where these two can work. They're children. They shouldn't have to work in a desert to break them of their will, okay? To break them of their spirit, to break them, to kill them. But she is saying that Jijo is sacrificing for them. No, she's not. Jijo is selling her home because they have an evil plan and they're going to kill these children. That's, in my opinion, that's my opinion. That's what was going to happen. They were going to end up like Tylee and JJ, Lori Vallow's kids. Okay, G. Joe has been looking for property with Soros Cactus. Soros Cactus. Let's look at that. Soros Cactus. Let's see what kind of cactus that is. Okay. So she's saying Soros Cactus. I'm not seeing something. I'm seeing a saguaro cactus which is in um which is the largest cactus in the united states but she's saying soros cactus let's see if there's five okay so let's see the things about this has an ability to hold and store water, shelter for desert wildlife, can grow up to 25 arms on it, and um, well, I don't know if the Soros Cactus, with Soros Cactus, and is feeling more imminent the need to get these kids to open land. Yeah, get these kids out of here. They're going to run away. They're going to fight back, right? She is willing to consider less than ideal property for them. This is a spiritual matter. I can't in good faith leave you with these two gremlins. I won't do that. These are God's children. Soros don't matter when souls are on the line. Okay? So whatever cactus that she needs, it doesn't matter. These souls, you see, are on the line. One hour later, we move quickly. Jody and Jay are going on a road trip to look at property in Arizona. Ruby has some cash in the bank. See, there's that money that's in that bank. If the property is right, we can move on financing immediately. We decided the escalation of the kids is not manageable here. Okay, so they're going to take them to another level. What are they going to do? Kill them? Work them to death? What was the, what was the evil plan? What was the evil plan? These kids escaped death. Truly. There's nothing else that I believe. 
That's what they were doing. In my opinion, that's what was going to happen. Look at this and read into it. She writes a lot of code, but it's easy to decipher. Okay. The escalation of these kids is not manageable here. The escalation. The bringing that abuse to the next level is not manageable here. Now R is now sitting angry, defiant. E is lying on the floor. We will bring them in. R, I will clean up out in the desert as he has pooped himself. He will then stand, sit on the patio, shaded. Now I'll see him from the kitchen. E, I will bring into the cool house. She can sit in the pantry. They will think they win. They won. They will think they got what they wanted. They will relax. Then, pop! We will drop them like hot potatoes out in the desert. Their new home. You are going to get exactly what you asked for. Look at that. Okay? See how sinister that is. What they're doing to these kids. Can you even imagine being those kids? They're, then pop. We will drop them like hot potatoes out in the desert. Their new home. You're going to get exactly what you asked for. Maybe they're going to chain them outside, right? Maybe they'll be eaten by animals. I, who knows what they were going to do? Sickening. Oppositional force is required for growth development, maturity. E and R have never experienced oppositional force. They are very weak-minded. Wow. Wow. Hold on, we've got to turn this over here, this picture. Okay, I'll have to read this upside down. I'll be good at this. Pattern. Sending evil away in a long time possessed person is not a one and done deal usually. The wicked spirits in ENR have been pals long before this life. Okay, so now they're saying past lives, okay? They're believing in the past lives that they've been they've been pals. How ENR got to come and get a body can only be explained in advocating to be so look at this now see this is crazy how E and R got to come and get a body can only be explained in me advocating to be their mother. This is not a conceited statement. God knew I would take responsibility to mother seriously. Jody Jody's Jody 
learn to help these two souls are very weak of mind. They are fools, truly. He said she would choose the devil over God. What? What something spew? God is patient not to split her with a bolt of lightning. You do not tempt a God who controls your very breath. The disdain The disdain they have for God is beyond my ability to describe. My spirit is offended. I shudder to think I would have, I never have seen this had I not, had I not pushed on them. Okay, let's see. Patterns will show you how much possession a soul has. The boundaries that well, the soul will reveal itself. will reveal a soul because of the limits built into tribulation back to sending evil away articulating truth drives evil away this is a powerful Something for the possessed. Even if you can start by agreeing to some truthful E-U-R-A daughter of God. True? Yes, ma'am. Following up on articulating drives for evil to, let's see here, with a demonstration of obedience is powerful. Demonstrating a willingness to follow truth is a pattern. Oh, now we can go to reading upright. The Savior used in his interactions. Go sell all you have and follow me. And sin no more. Go wash seven times. Tell no one. Tell the city. Preach my gospel. Feed my sheep. If you can engage a weak mind soul, weak-minded soul in a physical activity of obedience, you can begin to break the bond Satan made with the weak. Physically stop the acting out behaviors and begin physically doing good. Farm work, lifting boxes, exhorting energy, exercises, jump rope, milking cows, weeding a garden, digging trenches. Satan cannot be where there is good. Begin doing and sweating for good. Heavy physical intensity. Capture your attention. Yeah, these children are malnourished, underweight, and they're going to do this heavy labor in a desert. The problem for E and R is the hard labor is all... 
What the heck is that? Is all for the sake of lifting, does not have meaning or do good. We need property. See this? We need property where a ranch can be built. Good can be done. Outcomes of prosperous chorus can be seen and experienced. Excuse me, of prosperous choices can be seen and experienced and felt. And the kids need a good kick. See this? The kids need a good kick from a horse and a cactus to run into. They need to be hurt. They need to feel pain. They need to be injured, is what they're saying. They need natural outcomes. I asked R. Y. what he was thinking about since he was sitting in the shade and he had what he wanted. R. answered, what I want. Me, what do you want? R. More different foods, a soft bed. Well, let's say what he wants. Different foods and a soft bed. That's not something that he shouldn't have, right? Me, why don't you ask Satan? Do you think Satan will give you those things? Our answer is no. Me, why not? Because he doesn't have the power. Me, why would you serve a God who has no power to give you your desires? Dumb silent and you could see her with her smug face that we see in the prison in the jail her smug face saying this can't you see her doing this e had another episode with demons she gives herself to them she agreed to stop being deceptive with her facial expressions and crying and whining Whining is the devil's voice. Whining is always a demon. Huh. Unbelievable, Ruby. Her hurt facial expressions blame me for her misery. It is E at the center of her misery. Her face is deceptive. After E did stare, she sat on the park bench looking at the mountain views she was told to sit and be still and eat her dinner. Carrots, hummus, grilled cheese, water. E, in a power play, brought her empty plate to the door and then removed her sun hat. E woke up and I reminded her, this is 7.14, the day before he runs away. I reminded her that if she whined, cried or squinted her eyes at me or soured her face, I'm going to be buzzing your hair. I'll be buzzing her hair, right? Think about that. You squint your eyes at me, sour your face, you whine or you cry. I'm going to buzz your hair. If she is going to act sick, she can look sick. Wow. She agreed with a smile. I told her because she didn't listen the night before that she would do two sets of boxes stairs with a five minute break. She did the first set easily, agreeably. After five minutes of rest, she began whimpering. When she got to the bottom stairs, she slipped and dropped the box. I put her in the dog wash and I shaved her head. Oh my gosh. Then back to the boxes. I told E something and then she, they, yes, ma'am, with tears. Me, it's heavier than boxes, right? E, yes, ma'am. Me, E, I can help you find relief. You have told so many lies about me that you refuse to be obedient. Why do you keep being buddies with Satan? E, I don't want to work. Me. Don't you see it's because you follow Satan that you keep doing boxes? If you were humble, you would be inside making pancakes with blank and me. She agreed to sit on the park bench and think about her choices. I made it very clear. If she were to move, get up, fidget, talk, take her hat off, she would go back to work. E agreed eagerly. She promised to be obedient. After an hour on the bench, Eve began moving. She's just a little child is sitting on a bench outside 
okay, and she can't move. He began moving, looking around. I pulled her into the house and I gave her more boxes. Now to R, me. You like sleeping on the hard ground? Ah, I sleep in a soft bed. There she's tormenting them. And R says, I slept really well. Me, you are mean. Do you enjoy being mean? R, yes, ma'am. Me, do you expect me to feed you? R, yes, me. I got big over him. She got big over him, you know, big Ruby. Wouldn't you just like to be and make sure Ruby's carrying heavy boxes up and down stairs and um, doing all this stuff? Oh my gosh, Ruby, something, oh boy. So I will check on you in a bit. And if you want food, then be prepared to tell the truth about your behaviors. Tell the truth of who I am. And then uh, along comes Kevin, the father, that says, Oh, I did that too. She made me do that too. Kevin, get out of here. You're a grown man. Get out of here with your craziness. I swear, if he gets the kids back, they're in danger according to what he allowed, I believe. That's what I feel. I feel that they would be in danger again because for him to allow what happened in that house and just everything that he allowed um, and then still have contact with her and not, well, I just know, just know, he, I know. I, I don't think, I think, oh, that's bad. He, I don't know. I feel bad for those kids. Those kids really have to be somewhere I think without any of these people and um, be deprogrammed from all of this crap that was done to them. Okay. An hour later, me, you ready? No, ma'am. Me, so you would rather have no food and worship the devil? Or, yes, ma'am. E does first set of books decently 10 minute break e upset to do boxes gets them done sits on the park bench one minute then picks g joe's blossom off a plant defiant more boxes she refuses goes to sleep on the basement floor r stand up stop picking your nose the kids both pick their noses until they bleed Distraction. Me. You happy? R. No. Me. Can you believe this is the summer of their lives? There's only so many years to be a kid. And what they did is did this to them. Imagine what their whole life has been like. But then this summer, when these kids should have been carefree and playing and all that, this is what they did. Tortured them. Tortured them. Me, following Satan doesn't make you happy? Shocker. So Satan can't feed you? Who is supposed to feed you? R. I don't know what he's saying there. R. Oh, God. Me, and? R says Christ. Me. This is a game you play. Who brings you food? Are you me? You want to leave the demons? Are I don't want to humble. I told R I wanted to give him dinner with chicken. He needs to acknowledge his behaviors. He tells me he is missing his opportunity to repent. This is not acknowledging his behaviors. I tell R he is treating me and G. Joe, the way he believes he really deserves to be treated. I bring him dinner of brown rice, beans, lentils, and water. He takes the bowl and begins eating. I say, no thank you. Are you going to acknowledge the woman you've been abusing just brought you dinner? Look at, look at this gaslighting. The woman that you've been abusing has brought you dinner. Okay. This is so cruel. And then R says, well, I would say thank you, but I wouldn't really mean it. With that, I reached down and grabbed his dinner and water and said, wow, wow. 
are tried going back on what he said with some explanation i stopped him i will not talk with a demon your soul is damned i will not hear your damnable words straight to bed e has started walking stairs without a box she is now slipping falling on purpose when E was outside today, it was hot. She acted like she was dying, so pitiful. I told her, E, the heat in hell is much hotter, and God is going to burn the wicked, so either get used to it or start changing. E said, I don't really believe that's actually going to happen. The kids are all in bed. E ate mashed potatoes and turkey milk. G. Joe is looking at RV trailers. These kids have no idea the sacrifice is being made for them or Jesus' sacrifice already made. Yeah, sacrifice is being made for them. Are you kidding me? They want to abuse things. Now here's where he runs away and watch how she changes this into being a miracle. There are days and nights that reveal God's most poignant mercies and miracles. Last night, God gave me a miracle I absolutely will never, ever forget. I know when God gives you a an errand, you do the best you can to fulfill it. He will protect you. I went to bed around 12, 10 a.m. E on the floor next to my bed. R on the patio outside my sliding glass window. Oh man, just writing this, I am shaking. Shaking. Now here's Pam Boucher. If Pam hadn't volunteered to take A to American Fork for her ALT test, then I would not have been here. And my life in Jody's and my family would forever be different. Well, that's what happened. When she was gone to the dentist, that's when he was successful at getting away and going to the neighbors. So it would have been, if she would have been somewhere, he would have, it would have been different. 2.45 a.m., I woke straight up out of bed. Straight up. I couldn't see R. He was gone. I opened the sliding glass door and there was no sign of him. He did leave an arrangement of rocks in letters and words. He wrote me a message. Too scared. Forgot how to read. I ran to Jody's room and woke her up. She came out with me. The message said in pebbles, jail. I will call when I get there. I scoured the house and yard. Jody got flashlights. Jody took her car and I got up and went to mine. And she said, Oh God, oh Father, we need a miracle. We need your help now. Send the host of heaven. Show us where R is. And she said, please, please, Father, answer now. I've done everything you've asked. Protect me. And then she says to protect Jody, protect us, protect us. Heard in my head, go right. I went left. So she didn't even listen to the voice in her head, right? Go right. She goes left. I went left and all the way to the roundabout on the main street to rule it out and make sure he hadn't reached the main road yet. No sign of R. I turned back to go down the dip. So she knew she was wrong, right? She knew if, if he was found out, their lives would change forever because they would be ac accountable to what they're doing here. She knew she's acknowledging it's wrong, right? Their lives would change forever if he's somewhere where he can get to somebody. She knew she was doing wrong. She didn't think this was right. She wasn't being brainwashed and thought this is right. She knew this was wrong.
Okay, so then she turns back to go down the dip and then turn right. Father, 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 hear me how I go right. Then right again. This road doesn't look familiar. I speed up to cover as much road as I can, racing the sun, racing the devil, and then I see R walking on the left-hand side of the road. I call Jody to let her know. I turn the car around. I stop. I get out of the car. R is shocked to see me. Get in the car. You shocked to see me? R nods his head and gets in. In the back. Me. R in the front. 2.45. I woke up. 3 o'clock we leave in cars. 3.14. I called Jody with R. The sun started lighting the roads. Just an hour and a half later, the devil wants me in prison. My children dead. Now look at that. The devil wants me in prison, my children dead. That was her ultimate plan, right? If, her, if they found out and her children were dead, she'd be in prison. But she's saying the devil wants her in prison. She's knowing what she's doing is wrong and she will be in prison. I meet Jody back home. We deliberate in the car while they go back to bed. R stands in the garage where we can see him. He we need land. The spirit told Jody very clearly, don't let these kids' choices ruin your life. We have work to do. You can force repentance to de-escalate the situation. I brought R into the house. I tied a rope to my feet and him to my waist and his. R will now sleep in a soft bed with me. 7 a.m. R slept. The devil got a bed. Jody taught... Uh, Jody taught... something in class. Jody loaded the cooler. I put the kids in my car and took a drive. 8 a.m. A man came to look at Jody's house. 8.30. Jody and I met at the Shia Watts gas station. E and J. Jody took off to Tucson. I drive back to the house with R. He comes in the house. He doesn't leave my sight. I feed him chicken, rice, lentil, beans, but add a glass of milk. He sits at the counter and eats. He got what he wanted. I give him the book. Theophrastus Characters. He gets a pen, his journal. He takes notes. To any onlooker, he appears to be a well-behaved, studious young man. And wouldn't I be thrilled? My son, who wanted to run away, is now by my side. And reading and writing, wouldn't I be relieved? No. I now know that in order to keep my son, I will need to put him back under sedation. I unhooked him from all the bells and whistles and asked him, to breathe and thrive on his own, and he went into arrest and stress. Back to sedation we go. The demon is still here, and I purposefully put R back into a slumber. Hibernate to watch R go into the awful state of compliance, knowing the demon he harbors in his heart is so, so sick like Stitching up a patient knowing you didn't get all the cancer out and knowing it's only a matter of time before your patient kills over. Now look at that. Right? She's saying it's only a matter of time before he dies. R and E do not want to repent. They hate God for their own behaviors and words. I now see how perfectly reasonable people walk around hating God and worshiping to the devil 
yet appear like good old Joes, good guys. There is a soul kick infection in my child, and my hand is forced to not remove the infection. Agency does not allow, is forced to not remove the infection. Agency does not allow me to rid the infection. R and E like the infection. It's so sick. Yeah, what's so sick is what you're doing. 8.18 p.m. Just over 12 hours after finding R, teaching class and leaving, Jody sends me a text. I found the land. The devil does not want us to take R and E out of society. Take them out of society. Listen to that. He did not want Jody finding this property. He wanted Jody and I down at the police station at 818, not discovering a place to bring intervention to his entanglement of my children. Oh, how good the Lord is. Oh my goodness, th this lady. <sighs> to those who risk everything to follow him and bring others to him. The hosts of heaven are on one side. My children will never know the sacrifices and lives put on the line to offer a chance for their salvation. R can only think that he likes the taste of milk. And reading again. July 16th. Last night... I tied myself to R for night sleep, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. No interruptions. R showers while I watch. I shower while R is in the closet. I can see the closet door as I shower. Oats, chicken, rice, bean, lentils with cheese on a corn tortilla. Three sets of 10 push-ups. Reads Theophrastus. Jody is on her way home. E spent the ride lying down with her face facing the back of the seat. She doesn't know where they went or why. One might ask, as I asked myself, what if we had taken this slower? See, she knows she's going to go in prison. She knows what she's doing. Would the children have been on board if we hadn't boundaried them so quickly and so clearly, what if instead, at a full day of box carrying, we would have done an hour and breaks of reading and then back to boxes? My answer is, well, yes, the kids would have complied, but they would not be repenting. And they would have given the impression they were repenting. They needed things to get hard, fast, intense, shocking, change, immediate, discomfort, stress to their systems. Why? Because they divulged their secrets. They could have confessed in truth, talking personally personal responsibility for the discomfort they were causing. Wow. Something changed the environment of the kids slowly. Mine and were reasonably or comfortably, we would have never allowed this dumb hypnosis and sleep to stay over the child. We needed to wake the child up to the state of reality, show them where they really are and the pit of hell. They hope was that they would choose to go to God for forgiveness. To admit their awful state, instead they hid. They wanted to lie to themselves that what they did wasn't that bad. That they were the victims. I'm trying to say they 
me and Jody and the prosecutors, persecutors, that burning in hell isn't real, that God is that mad and that God doesn't even exist. They deny the power of God. I told R today that he is sedating his choices to do wickedly. I don't want that anymore. My response, yes, you do. You stood alone with only you, your choices, and you literally would stand it. You ran away. You refused to sit and stand with your choices. And you now are in the house with milk, air conditioning, and a book. And you quite like it, don't you? Or, yes, ma'am. Me. If you really didn't want evil anymore, you would say, Mom, thanks for the book, but I want to do boxes today. Or, I want to stand with my choices. You won't do that, will you? Or, no ma'am, me. See? I want to make it clear to you. You have not made any shifting or change. You are damaging your soul. Or, goes back to writing. Yes, ma'am. Weak-minded. Undisciplined. Brat. Note to myself, I never clearly saw the devil. A weakness until recently. Relieved I didn't see evil wickedness. My love of God was sincere, but... Assumed others' love for God was sincere as well. I was deceived. To begin a separation from evil toward God, all the darkness needs exposed to light. And once the lies and sin is revealed, the body must engage in good work. And the good works need to be painful. Otherwise, the Serbia bloom becomes another feel-good distraction. A day of fasting and prayer for me after learning my children have been spawns of Satan. R has been out of control. Pee, poop, lie, steal, run away. E, crying, wailing. You could not know what this has been like unless you were here. Jody and I took E out to the desert. She refused to stay quiet and would scream and scream. Jody found a reservation cemetery. Chivitz Cemetery. She went out in the heat, barefoot. E still tried to run. She screamed for another family, for water, for food, for care, for love. Oh, E, a manipulative ploy. You are loved. And after a couple of hours of screaming and speaking nonsense, E finally laid down in the road quiet. We took her home. We took E and R out and the next day E and R barefoot to increase the discomfort and decrease, decrease the running away. The task at hand was to weed the cemetery. Huge sagebrush, pokies, thorns, broken glass, garbage over full. We spent a couple of hours filling black bags and G. Dro's truck bed. The kids began to mellow out a bit. R looked for shade and cheating. We went out the next day and again today, five hours of weed pilling. R finally started getting the hang of it. This is getting easier. I feel I'm getting stronger. I want to pull the weeds out of my heart. What am I doing with my life? I don't want to live like this anymore. All children need the experience of pulling obnoxious weeds, sweating in the sun, working while thirsty, and knowing what doing an anonymous act of service feels like. They are each 
beginning to see how nice the cemetery looks after days of their hard work. Yesterday, R was devious and put his head in the toilet. He said he was hot and wanted to cool off. Jody and I reflected how disgusting and deviant that is. He's a problem. That R has no problem being gross. July 25th, Tuesday, 7 to 8.30, women's group, 8.30 a.m. Ruby takes E, R, and J to the cemetery. Each child is given a bag to pick up broken glass and weeds. We work for about 15 minutes and a red vehicle with a woman, Indian, shows up. She sits and watches us for about 15 minutes, taking photos or video. I tell the kids to stay right by me and keep their faces from being pictured. We continue to pull weeds. The woman gets out of her vehicle and walks towards me. This isn't your land. You are trespassing. I tell her I'm weeding. She tells me, how would you feel if I came and poked around your cemetery? What are you stealing? Me, nothing. We are weeding picking up trash. She wants to know what's in the bags. I say weeds and broken glass. You can see for yourself. She tells me to leave the bags and get off her land. It's not good enough for you that you came and take all of our land and now you want more. What you have isn't good enough. You have to come take our cemeteries too? What's wrong with you? You were not raised right. So much disrespect. I told her I do not mean any disrespect. I'm honoring your people. I'm offering. She would not let me get any words in. I collect my children, walk to the car. She yells at the kids that they will grow up to be <coughs> just like their mother. White, full of privilege. Mind your own business. Get out. I'm filing a police report. I tell the kids to get into the car, and she wants me to wait so she can get a good photo of us, the license plate. I don't think so. We drove off as she stumbles to get her camera app up. This woman was projecting all her anger and aggression onto me. She told me I was walking around acting like I owned the place when that is what she was doing. She wasn't raised right. She was disrespectful. We leave and I talk to E&R about how this woman was attacking us with her distortion. There we go with the distortion. A couple days ago, we met a woman who thanked me for helping her keep the graveyard clean. And now this woman tells us we are aggressive when really she is the aggressor. I told the kids is exactly what they are doing. I'm helping them and they mock and reject my help. God sent me to help them repent and they turn me away. The kids seem a bit affected because they are so numb. I don't know how long it will had. R is very emotional. E not so much. She is seeing and hearing evil. I told her that she invited evil. It's her change to now send them away. You created this, E. The good news is because you created this, you can destroy this. Send them away. August 1st. Jody went to Tucson today to look at property of 500 acres. E and R are both defiant and unwilling to soften. E this week perpetually screamed outside. Jody and I something her and took her to Hellhole Road. Yes, this is such a road on your way to Las Vegas. She was to run on the dirt road. She ran for a bit then started manipulating. I told her to run up an incline on the side on a hillside. Touch a tree and return a hundred yards max. She thought herself 
She threw herself into a tree. Jody pulled her out, breaking her flip-flops. After an hour of E jumping in the bushes, we got in the truck to find a cactus. E walked right up to the cactus and threw herself into the middle of it. It was unhuman. She acted like it didn't hurt at all. She cuddled right in. I watched her press her foot up against a cactus ear. I watched with my mouth open. She is so numb. After being cozy with the cactus, E got up and spoke with Jody for about 10 minutes. Jody E walked to the truck. I rolled down the window. E said, may I have permission to speak? Yes. We get in the truck, drive to the hill. E gets out and comes to my window. Mother, what would you like me to do? I instructed her to run to the dead tree, then come back. E replied, I would rather jump into a cactus. What evil, what deception. This girl would choose to be shot and die than to humble. Do what she, see here, shot and die. There's a thing, right? Shot and die. And do what she is told. There is no pain point where she will turn. The next day, July 30th, Sunday, we put E in the closet and contemplate what to do. She screams much of the day. She doesn't get water if she screams. She refuses to eat. July 31st, Monday, Jody wakes up from a dream. God lets her know we have done everything we can to get E's attention. It says, Lord, don't continue these physical interventions. They will only bring resentment. E is angry about her feet. Dress her wounds and leave her to me. Okay, so that's what she's saying the Lord said to her, okay? This intervention gives the opportunity for E to soften and see that we aren't hurting her. Jody cleaned her heels cleansed her heels. The hydrogen peroxide didn't sting. E is numb to it. The spirit was very strong as Julie and I witnessed Jody cleaning what didn't deserve to be cleaned. After dressing the wounds, Julie carried her back to the closet. E did scream, sulk, and ask for water. I gave her lunch, leftovers, several meals, she wouldn't eat, okay? So she gave her leftovers of several meals she wouldn't eat, very Joan Crawford, and she finally ate. I gave her water and then the scriptures. This is the first opportunity to have reading material since coming to Jody's, me. When you see God, he will judge you out of these books. Did you honor your mother? No. Did you keep his commandments? No. Did you repent? No. You are in big trouble. You better get really familiar with what's in here. Our feet are swollen from standing. He is angry. Nobody cares. I told him he is acting like a man having a heart attack and gets his feelings hurt because nobody cares about the sliver in his finger. When your soul is dying, nobody cares about your feet. So their souls are dying is what she's saying, right? August 2nd, Wednesday, Jody and I, Jody and uh, he are, somebody are still away. He is distracted by being in the house, getting socks, being held and carried and out of the elements. She reads her Bible. She ate her beans, rice, chicken. She's quiet. R sat outside yesterday and didn't manipulate. I asked R why he didn't manipulate yesterday. He said because he wanted to change. I said, no, that's not true. You didn't manipulate because you weren't uncomfortable. You weren't hurt, I think she says. Today... R is standing outside on the patio by the room. It's raining. The rain is doing what? R, washing what is, what it touches. The rocks? Yes. Yeah. 
you desecrated these rocks and the rain is cleaning them. Let it clean you too. He pooped himself. He is angry. August 6th. R's rage comes out as he can't have what he wants, which is to serve the devil. AKA have no responsibility and have me, mom, tout on his, tout on him, coddle him. He wants both. Feed me, hug me, be tender with me, shower me in praise and affection, and let me lie to you, abuse you. Today, he raged for hours. F you, at least. 50 times. I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm never going to change. Take me to jail where I belong. August 7th. We'll come start we'll start something in the basement so Jody can sell her home. We'll start start I don't know. Something in the basement to Jody can sell her home. This is great news. Only something is yelling obscene obscenities. Jody asked R, what are you going to say when you see God? F you, R answered, sure. Something canceled. They gave us a useful day for at the end of the day, he was docile, compliant. E cried today, compliant. August 8th. R is very defiant. I found his finger is poopy. He keeps pooping, peeing in his pants within five minutes of him going to the bathroom. He went in his pants. Hiding it from me. Tried hiding it from me. Later, the spirit told me to ask him some questions and I asked from an assumption position. It's all redacted. That's what she asked. Mom to R, you keep saying you're unwilling to do uncomfortable things, but I watch you continuously do uncomfortable things. The devil tells you to do. You would rather be uncomfortable than to be obedient. This isn't really about being uncomfortable. This is about adamantly refusing obedience. You would rather be uncomfortable rather than obedient. Is that true? R, yes, ma'am. Mom to R. When did you sell your soul to the devil? R, two or three, mom. Did he come to you or you to him? He came to me, mom. And what is he giving you in exchange for your soul? Money, fame, strength, a person, or nothing. I tell R, he can still keep his soul. He can have a life. He to stay here, I told him to think to be obedient to a devil who offers nothing in exchange for everything. R becomes aggressive and destructive. He started banging and hitting doors. I went in and kicked him. Okay. Went in and kicked him. Knock this off. R continues to be destructive and violent. I put on a pair of boots. I went in. I kicked him again. No. You want me to serve the devil and fight me and destroy all that I provide and then expect me to give to you? Go ask the devil to help you. Go ask the devil to feed you. I left R. was quiet, contained in the clo uh, I guess in the closet. I did leave him yelling. I got that you're rage fuel. I got that you're angry. You should be, but you've got to aim that anger in the correct direction. You keep aiming it at me. I'm trying to help you get your life back. Uh, 
get angry, denounce Satan. When I left, R was quiet for a bit, then started calling Satan a big lying piece of baloney. He continued raging and yelling, crying, I've believed you. What do you give me? Nothing but pain. You lie, and I've believed you. I'll admit it. I've been a fool to follow you, but no more. It's not too late. I can turn my life around. Get lost. Get lost. I can get my life back through obedience. Is this sincere? His actions will show. Or is manipulating his hand. He wets his pants. Ruby to R. You cannot manipulate your way out of pain. You need to pray and show God how you have desecrated your precious body. How you misuse your body. Beg him to help you. I've been such a fool. I don't want to make these choices anymore. Please hear me, God. I won't live this way anymore. My life is crappy. It doesn't have to be this way. Obedience is the way. I've desecrated my soul. I know I can change. I still have a chance. My chance is getting smaller and smaller. I'm not going to choose that any, this anymore. I'm not going to make myself a fool anymore. I've made myself such, such, such a fool. I believed all those lies and all they bring is pain. God, I've made choices So idiotic. I've been so aggressive, so vile, so mean. God, please hear me in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. August 10th. Jody. Jay are still in Arizona. They should be back tonight. I am watching R in the closet and E on the back patio. It's warm outside, raining. I told R the rain is cleaning the rocks from dirt. R and R's P. I told her to feel the rain clean her. I told her she can be as clean as she wants to be. I checked in on R and asked him what he was thinking about. How many choices have led me here? Me. Did you know you were in a dark pit of despair? R. What do you mean? He stood in the rain for two hours. The 15 Tuesday. For the human who is not humble, today this constitutes the vast majority. You have to get to your breaking point. R never would have disclosed his sins had he not had a hope that confessing would bring a sense of relief. His motive, because he was is not humble, was to feel better because all his distractions were taken away. Any bullet he was getting then back banished we were consistent we followed through and we were left with R was left with only one outlet to find relief confession the world we live in today does not support children being uncomfortable they the adults are uncomfortable with children being uncomfortable and so children are comforted and they're entertained and distracted from the need to confess and change stripping down a child's world to the basics of beans rice hard work would be considered abuse and it's not it's necessary for the prideful child now that r has his behaviors out all of them he feels like a failure a monster useless worthless the relief he felt in confession was short-lived and now there is nowhere to hide. So he becomes overly aggressive, destructive, and combative. Foul language I've never heard is now pouring out. It's his only distraction. Poop, pee, damage. The despair comes in. He is weak. Infectious, helpless hopeless and never felt worse a setup from the devil 
Now is the work. It has been three months of consistent boundaries and putting up with terrorizing to get his confession out. Who would do this in the real world? I don't know of anyone who would feed their kid in America beans and lentils, rice and chicken for three straight months. Refuse all distractions and that is why Americans are so full of sin and are ready for destruction. They won't repent. August 16th, day two of our jumping on a mini trampoline. He needs a lot of help with balance coordination. Today I asked him to take off one sock by balancing on the opposite foot. Lift one foot up and remove the sock while staying balanced. He fell over and hit his nose on the ground and began bleeding. I gave him a something rag to wipe his face. Toilet paper. He dabbed his face merely to smear the blood. Then he blew his nose so harshly through the toilet paper he got new blood on his face and all over his shirt. The easiest exercises he is asked to do, he refuses. With the decrepit stature you would expect of a 90-year-old, he plays completely helpless. His body is full of evil, puffy infractions, infections, and he won't participate in true responsibility of fleshing it out. Our's life meaning and purpose has been don't get caught. And now that he's caught, he wants to be done with life. He feels he has no meaning. August 21st. Poking is a strategy technique. R seems to respond to poking, pouring cold water, and a towel wet. And by poking, I'm sure she means using a cactus poker, which is leaving little, those little uh, cactus needles into it, in his skin, right? That's what she's talking about. Horrific stuff. Okay. August 22nd. 2023. First day, R soaked, jumped as told. He did wet his pants twice. God, uh, I think it's God, she put there, pelted hail from the heavens. He is poking R as well. R stayed jumping. Hail in August in St. George is a mystery. A heavenly validation of this intervention. Look at all this. August 27th, Sunday. Okay. Uh, let's see. A visited for a week last week. I picked her up last Sunday and took her home to Springville on Friday. J, I don't know, Pam and I packed 20 boxes and took them to the storage shed in Springfield. So this is three days. Look at that. It's three days. Took him to a storage shed. And vis I visited for a week last week and picked her up last Sunday, and took her home to Springfield. Pam, 20 boxes, and took them to a storage shed in Springville. Springville, well, she brought them all the way up to Springville. And gave, A gave her two weeks notice. Or, say, okay, they knew it. They were, they were getting ready. That's it. R spent the 27th to the 25th peeing, pooping. He is out of control. He is defiant, abusive. A moan. A mean. And mean. He refuses to do what he is asked. Just when I think we found a technique that will work, R digs in and fights harder, willing to try anything that would grab his attention. Willing to try anything that would grab his attention, I whipped him with a belt yesterday. E2. She peed all over Jody's garage floor. 
screamed at her and lied to her. She is out of control. E seemed to give me her attention after the whipping. She swept the garage with some muscle and mopped it. She did a good job. R increased his defiance. Is Tusa taught at New Jersey Institute of Technology, University of Washington, Dean of the Computing College, Robert Friedman. Send one essay for each girl. PDF of curriculum Venmo. What the heck is that? Okay, that's the journal there. Wow, that's horrendous. Now let's see here, DB. Now. His infections are his fault, too. Yeah. So, that's crazy, right? I hope wherever those children now, they're getting pizza, chicken nuggets, and any snack they enjoy. Most of all, lots of love and hugs. Oh, boy. That's definitely like a cult. They need deprogramming. Um, all the stuff that they've been told that's horrendous, right? Just horrendous. Um, hang on a moment. I have to put my phone on the charger, but wow. Just try to like take that all in. Just how crazy these two are. Why they should not be around any children anymore. Definitely not be counseling anyone anymore. Just so crazy. So freaking crazy. That's just nuts. I don't know. What time is it? So, digest that first second, and then we're going to see something. That's never right dina that that is like crazy and she knew it because when he ran away or when she kept talking about she'd be in prison she knew what she was doing is wrong okay it, it's not that she believed she was doing something good no 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 not at all hold on i'm getting a drink of water um she knew. She knew it was wrong. Definitely knew it was wrong. Oh my goodness. What a crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm back. Sorry, I took some water. That was a lot of reading. Okay, so let's go on and see what else is here. Oh boy. That is nuts. Nuts, nuts, nuts. All right. 
so much for the packing I thought I'd be doing tonight. Getting some more things up. Maybe I'll do it in the morning. Okay, let's go into... It was so... <clears throat> okay. So I guess there's a 2020 episode about this and saying that he does the second interview with, um, with police, which we heard. Does he change? Well, yeah, I think he's just kind of, I don't know, a 40-year-old woman whimpering, I'm a good girl, really feels uncomfortable. Why is she in for that? Yeah, that is weird when she says, I don't do naughty things. I don't do, don't do naughty things. I am a good girl. So let's see about these connections. Someone's asking if the connections members, is people that watch that channel, and if, if they're speaking out. I'm curious about that. Somebody said there is a mo there was a Mom of Truth Facebook group, and after it was left unmoderated, people started coming out of the woodwork celebrating the arrest of Ruby and Jody. Anyone who came out against celebrating them was given hell to the point they deleted their social. So I assume they still have quite some amount of support, but they learned quickly not to be public. Let's see here. And then people are talking about Kevin talking about that supernatural stuff, right? Stuff flowing through the air. And, and what about that? If anyone has any thoughts on this. Yeah, let's see what people are saying about this, right? Um, some people say that Jody was drugging people without their knowledge. Um, but stress and sleep deprivation can also bring on hallucinations. Kevin talks about Jody waking them up multiple times each night to help her fight off demons. Okay. And then somebody says one of the first things any cult will do is start the members on a grueling schedule of all day activity, whether it's hard labor or just a lot of energetic group, happy, clappy, or both. They'll be at it till late at night and up at or before dawn, day after day, and it really takes a toll especially if it's combined with a lot of sensory overstimulation with lights, music, other sounds, a lot of subtle and less subtle unbalancing, take someone out of their comfort zone, probably not enough food. We also know Pam, Jody, and Ruby went to Mexico and bought a heap of prescription drugs. And Kevin said the three of them would disappear into Jody's bedroom and emerge hours later on cloud nine. Yeah, on cloud nine. That's exactly what I said about cloud nine. Okay. Yeah, that's what I said. Right. She suggested, some suggested that they could be having sexual relations, could be a combination of both, but Ruby and Jody end up sharing a bed. Okay. I need 
need more water here let me see um we definitely see this jody staying there and keeping them all up with the fear of demons start with the fact that everyone involved was already primed with magical thinking total cult vibes all utterly insane Okay, so it's saying, um, I, I think it, he may just be saying it now because he's trying to make people think he had no control over this. I think he's just trying to save his own arse. Someone's saying he was drugged. And that seems like it could be possible, too. Let's see. Shari is such a good child. I didn't realize how much he looks like. But having these many kids, she passively took it out on me, making them do extra chores, denying them food. These phone calls. These and the statements. We went through the witness statements. We went through her journal. <clears throat> Let's see. Went through all of that. Oh, here's something. Okay, here. Hold on a minute. <clears throat> I'm going to read something <clears throat> from February 11th of 2024. And this is a letter from Ruby Frankie's parents to the parole board. Dear judge and parole board, we are Ruby Frankie's parents. We are currently serving a full-time mission in Serbia. Before Ruby became involved with Jody Hildebrand, and they spelled Jody's name wrong. They spelled it with a Y, which is interesting. Hold on a minute. Sorry, I just needed something to drink. And, okay. And I, chew, I had to chew a piece of ice. I'm very sorry. Sharon would say it's because I'm anemic that I'm chewing ice. And maybe she's right. Because Ro Ruby became involved with Jody Hildebrandt before Judy became... Oh my gosh, I can't even speak now. Before Ruby became involved with Jody Hildebrand, she was a wonderful mother, daughter, sister, and member of the church. All she ever wanted from the time she was a little girl was a family to love and nurture. But that, this is not true because we, we know 
she was with the lunches and with Chad and all that stuff, right? When she began having troubles with her teenage son, Chad, she sought out a family therapist counselor to help them. We noticed a shift in Ruby's thinking the summer of 2020, and by that fall, she cut all ties to us, her siblings and close friends. For three years, what brief communications we had with her, she accused us of either things that never happened, or she grossly exaggerated the events that did. She was delusional. She was so deeply brainwashed, we could not recognize her. Well, where was she getting that from? Because she, okay, that wasn't, okay. We received a postcard from Ruby two months after the terrible news of the children. We read her tender apology and humble acceptance of accountability. She expressed her gratitude for being incarcerated and felt the mighty wake-up call was a huge blessing. Since then, we have seen a return to the Ruby we once knew. Her thoughts and views are her own now. Her love, appreciation, and commitment to her family is stronger than it has ever been. Ruby is more concerned about her eternal salvation than her imprisonment, her testimony of the Savior, and his and his atoning powder power means everything to her. As her mother and father, we plead with you to show her as much mercy as you possibly can. Hopefully, in time, she will have a relationship with her children and they will remember the mother she once was to them and will find it in their hearts to forgive her. This would be the greatest healing balm of all for them. Oh my goodness. Sincerely, Chad and Jennifer Griffiths. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let me see this now. Jody's physician. Let's see, in the past, so there were um, concerns about, hold on, let me see this. I didn't want to crunch ice in your ear, so, but I had to have another piece of ice. Okay. So in Springville, it says that uh, this is from 2022, that neighbors and an older sibling called authorities to Ruby Frankie's Springville home to try to get help for several children in 2022. That was a year before the Jody situation, right? Records, uh, the records show police responded to the home more than a dozen times more than a dozen times hold on a minute this is loading up and okay there it goes during the last four and a half years so 
That's a long time. Several of those visits were related to concerns about the children's well-being. The new revelations come one week after the 12-year-old child escaped from the Ivan's home of Jody Hildebrandt, right? And we know all of that that happened. Police arrested the child's mother, Ruby Frankie, and the owner of the home, Jody Hildebrandt. Okay, so let's see what happened. The newly released records raise questions about whether authorities should have intervened sooner. They also corroborate claims from the Frankie's neighbors. Investigators under the condition of anonymity saying that they had previously tried to get the children help by contacting the Division of Children and Family Services. Okay. Springville Police visited the Frankie home 15 times between March 2019 and August 31st. During at least five of those visits, police were assisting DCF services. In April 2022, a Springville police report revealed Division of Children and Family Services had been alerted that two children were running out in the road unsupervised, and the caseworker requested police drive through the area. The officer wrote they responded but did not see any kids in the street. Months later, on September 18, 2022, police responded to the Frankie home again, this time at the request of Frankie's oldest daughter. According to the report, neighbors informed her that her younger siblings had been left home alone for days. Oh, I remember reading this back in the day. While Ruby was in St. George with her friend. Officers responding wrote, they saw children in the home, but the children would not answer the door. Officers saw the children on the phone, and they go upstairs where they were out of sight. When the police approached neighbors who gathered outside, they immediately started telling us about how the mother of the residents, Ruby Frankie, will leave her children alone for extended periods of time and go to St. George to spend time with her friend, Jody Hildebrandt. Okay. Police documented the neighbors' names and contact information. Everyone who came on the scene was very concerned about the children. Police call records for the address show that officers followed up days later, September 22nd, and then visited the home three more times on the 23rd, 26th, and October 3rd. Neighbors say that they were aware others in the community had contacted authorities about the situation. They say the behavior they saw was hard to label as abuse. They had suspicions the children were being mistreated, but didn't have concrete evidence of it, especially not evidence of physical abuse. One of the neighbors said they knew about the Frankie household is the same information as what their large online audience knew. They talked about the child having his bedroom taken away, and that was Chad, and they talked about the time another child went hungry at lunch because she forgot to pack her own lunch. Okay. So their now defunct eight passengers YouTube channel had 2.3 million subscribers. It was a family vlog channel and it documented the lives of Ruby Frankie, her husband and their six kids. She made videos with parenting advice showed methods of disciplining her children, which have drawn sharp criticism online. And then Jody Hildebrand, a licensed clinical mental health counselor in Utah. She founded Connections Classroom, an Oren-based com company, which, according to its website, aims to invite and encourage healing and facilitate personal growth through impeccable honesty, rigorous personal responsibility, and vulnerable humility.
that site doesn't look like it is available anymore. Let me see. Um, yeah. Okay, let me go back to where we were here. Okay, so a video posted in August of 2022 featured Jody Hildebrand saying, hitting your child creates fear. She said there's other ways to grab your child's attention. She goes on to say, hitting children creates a dynamic of fear and other ways of getting their attention will probably take more effort. They'll just get hit, and then they'll look at you like, so, now what are you going to do? Hit them harder? You know, like pummel them? Now you've lost your intervention. And more and more kids are going towards where they just don't appear to be phased. Over the years, Frankie's treatment of her children, which has been filmed and posted, has been met with controversy and concern. In one clip that's been reposted several times, Frankie admits to withholding food from her children. Kevin Frankie, right? Um, he moved out of the house. Yeah, great. Okay, guys, hang on. Looking at that volcanic pie, volcano pie. I hope someone gets that kid her own volcano pie. All right, let's see where you guys are here. So, Andy Millions, is there any proof of Ruby's sister contacting police because her sister Bonnie? said they did everything they could to intervene. Uh, did she? You remember her speaking of truth and distortion with the children during APA. I'm pretty sure she was influenced. Oh, yeah. She, yeah, yeah. Truth and distortion, yeah. Okay, let me see now. Bonnie, let me check. All right, let me get Bob, let me look at, uh, let me look at this, okay. Bonnie's statement. So Bonnie made a video statement, right? Um, and people are saying Kevin shouldn't be anywhere near those kids either, right? That he abandoned them when his family needed his fatherly care. The fact that Shari doesn't even have a relationship with him is making people do a double take. And he was the one who could have got emergency custody order, done something, even if it was getting Ruby medical help for obviously mental health issues that she didn't have. Okay, and a lot of people are saying, I wouldn't want him around the kids now either. He has ties to connections, and he should only be in unsupervised con be in supervised contact. Let's see.
The fact that Sherry has turned to them and has trusted them in her healing, I'm sure she will. Hold on. Bonnie screwed up posting, and I'm glad she's getting called out for it. Okay, so apparently she posted a video, then she posted it to private. She posted it privately. Let's see. Bonnie has always been the most emotional in the family, often going with her heart over her head. I can see why people would think her video was ill-advised. Okay. And why she took the video down. She didn't go into any detail about the case. Okay. Okay, so let me go back. That didn't really give me a big thing there. Let me see. So the family did as much as they could. Ruby Frankie's sister did as much as we could. Ex Frankie friend doubts the claims the sisters tried to help the kids. Okay, Ruby Frankie's siblings cards. Ruby says Ruby Frankie's kids will be okay. Oh boy. I don't think so. Ah, uh, let's see. I knew they were off. Ruby Frankie, Ruby Frankie. Bonnie Hall. We see something. Oh boy. I married my high school sweetheart. He made me a mom of four kids, all born living in Utah. I make vlogs on family. We are family vloggers on YouTube. We love sharing our milestones with all of you. I am not my sister. I am not my sister's crimes. How I got scammed. She made a video a, a day ago. How I got scammed. I should have asked questions. What the freak? And it's about hoarding that food. It looks like the hoarding the... It looks like garbage bags full of food. Allegedly. She has a lot of videos now. How I told my kids about Aunt Ruby. Profiting off the uh, it's funny how I wonder if, if she was as successful as Ruby before, and how all of them are so successful with this. This is vlogging, right? Ellie and Jared. 
Let me see here. What's going on? Someone said, I used to watch Ellie and Jared, Bonnie, and the other family members when I was younger. I've stopped watching them because they're always clickbaiting everyone every single day, and that got boring really quick. The clickbaiting is nonstop with them. It's so annoying. I stopped watching them just before the news of the abusive situation with Ruby's kids. I hope they get justice and lots of therapy and help soon. Also, what happened to the dog, Dwight, that they adopted before they went off of YouTube? He was so adorable. Dwight. Okay, let's see. I used to watch Ellie and Jared. I stopped. Then I started with Bonnie and Eight Passengers. I watched all through high school. It's insane and disgusting to think about this whole situation. See here. Ruby Frankie's sister deletes another. Did they write a letter to the uh, judge? Capitalize on their son's huge accident. Oh boy. The perfect Bonnie. Oh dear. Frankie's sisters, Julie, Griffith, Daru, and Bonnie, YouTubers themselves, share videos detailing Frankie's separation from the family. Oh my goodness gracious. Master, but they're always, you know what? They're always building another house. Like literally they're always building another house. These, blo these vloggers, like how many houses do they build? But at any time you look at them, oh, look, the new master bath tile. Oh, look, we're doing another rebuild. Oh, look, we're doing this. We're doing constantly. I don't know. I I think they're all Lincoln's birth live. Oh my goodness. When was that? 19 week ultrasound. My first time hosting Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving 2023. The phone. Oh my goodness. They are. It's so contrived. It's so clickbaitish. Oh, please give me a break here with you. Sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't. I, I think they, they. How do we know they're, they? They don't. How was Ruby Frankie raised? Let me ask you that. Did, does anybody know how she was raised? Has she ever spoken about that? Hey, okay, let's see about Ruby Frankie. Uh, here's her in uh, happier time. Well, we don't know if it was happier for her. I'm sure. I don't. She loves. She loves prison now, right? She's ministering to women. She's helping people. 
Let's see where she began. Her public downfall began in 2020 when skeptics of her and her husband began to grow worried about the Mormon family's strict household. I believe she started in 2015, so five years came and gone, right? So she has three sisters, Ellie, Julie, Bonnie. The three sisters, who all are family vloggers and social media influencers, said we wouldn't feel right moving forward with regular content without addressing the most recent events. And once we do, we will not be commenting on it further. Oh, good. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so the eight passengers channels and the connection channels were banned from the YouTube platform. A YouTube spurks, spurks, oh, can't even speak. spokesperson said that the platform has terminated the two channels linked to Ruby Frankie in accordance with their creator responsibility guidelines and that it was prepared to delete other channels that might attempt to re-upload her content. Now, Jody Hildebrandt's niece, Jessie Hildebrandt, did an interview September 11th and said that their aunt, Jody Hildebrandt, had abused them while under her care for roughly a year when they were a teenager. Jessie alleged the abuse, which they allege happened for more than 10 years ago, was similar to the reported details about the Frankie children. And she said, and I quote, the things that I experienced while living with Jody, I experienced being tied. I experienced being duct tape. I experienced being blindfolded. I experienced severe isolation. I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. I experienced being told I shouldn't be around other people. Being told that I was dangerous to be around. People were afraid of me to the point where I was afraid of myself. She recalled that she was isolated for up to 12 hours a day. She was forced to sleep outside in the snow once while under Jody's care, as well as alleging that Jody accused her of being a sex addict. I, I swear, I think this woman is, Jody had this problem, and I think she got off on telling people that they were this, especially the men that they were pee addicted and this and that, and then talking with them. And I think that she got enjoyment from that. She did, I believe, in my, because she's obsessed with it. Obsessed with it. Everybody is, according to her. And being addicted to pleasuring herself. Jesse decided to speak out about their experience after reading a report of Frankie's claims of S abuse within her family. I've never met Ruby, but the things that she is saying and regurgitating are very, very familiar to me. The philosophies and the therapeutic modalities that she is using are Jody's, and these are not new. This is a pattern, as they talk about patterns, right? Okay. It says that initially Ruby Frankie believed Jody had the insight to offer her path to continual improvement and that Jody took advantage of this quest and twisted it into something heinous, said her attorneys. Yeah, okay. The attorneys claim that Jody systematically isolated Ruby from her extended family, older children, and her husband. The prolonged isolation resulted in Miss Frankie being subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Jody's influence.
Oh, somebody said this about her being very flirty with men. So it says, um, one of her neighbors who spoke on the condition of anonymity said, and I quote, we would see how she was with her kids. And then I would see these ridiculous YouTube or Instagram videos of her pontificating and lecturing and preaching about how to be a mom of truth. And I was just like, this is the craziest thing. This is the worst mother I know of. The neighbor shared a handful of stories about Ruby Frankie's behavior and alleged that she often flirted with the other men in the neighborhood, but often spoke about the evils of lust. The Frankie family lived in Springville, Utah, about four hours north of where she was arrested at Jody Hildebrand's home. She was very flirty with men to where I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. She'd be very flirty with you, especially if she caught you alone going out to your mailbox or something like that. And then at the same time, publicly, she would act differently. The neighbor said there was an incident, I guess, where a girl wore a two-piece swimsuit to a pool party in the neighborhood, which is normal, right? And she just went ballistic. And she was lecturing people in the local LDS congregation about lust and the evils of this. And that and the virtues of modesty. And yet she would be really flirty with men. I always thought that was a weird thing. The neighbor said he remembers conversations he and his wife had about her behavior. I was like, what is she hiding? It feels like if she feels shame or guilt about maybe the way she is. And if <coughs> so, she overcompensates. And then we noticed the same thing with the kids. She was honestly just an absolutely horrific mom. saw some weird things, huh? Let's see. Okay, apparently Ruby Frankie's husband tried to have his daughter arrested on burglary charge after police searched the home. He allegedly wanted to have his estranged daughter arrested on a burglary charge after police broke into his home to serve a warrant. Okay. Police search Frankie's home in Springville, Utah. Kevin filed a police report. After he discovered his house had been broken into, telling an officer that electronics had been stolen. I cannot remember this one too when you're walking around. He suspected that his oldest daughter, Shari, was responsible. Kevin stated that Shari is not allowed in the home and that he believes she entered unlawfully and he wants her charged with burglary. Wow, Kevin, give it a break. What are you hiding, Kevin? Police reportedly wrote in the incident. Springfield police then told Kevin that police had executed a search warrant and that his daughter was not responsible for the damage. The officer reportedly told Kevin that Sherry was unaware that she was not allowed to take the electronics out of the home and they were returned. There were three tablets, three cell phones, three cameras, written journals, and three passports. Oh, wow. Shari Frankie was estranged from both Ruby and Kevin and had called police in September of 2022 requesting a welfare check at the family home. Shari has been vocal after her mother's arrest, moving to gather internet clips at, that show abuse by her mother, posting to Instagram stories after Ruby's arrest. Shari snapped a snap of the officers outside the family's house and wrote, finally. When asked about the police report involving Shari, Carrie Kevin Frankie's attorney, Randy Kester, 
said, at the time, Kevin was understandably upset that his front door had been broken and much of his property had been taken, including personal property as well as private and personal electronic devices and their contents. It was his home and property, and he was never served with a warrant. Moreover, this allowed other third parties who did not live at the home to access his home and property, and of which they took advantage, notwithstanding that he is considered to be a significant what was what he considered to be a significant and hurtful violation of the sanctity of his home and property. Kevin has taken oh, da, 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 healing path. He has taken da, 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 right. Okay. Ruby Frankie once took Christmas away from two kids. Punishments were so extreme. Okay. So anyway, they say on one of the last episodes of Connections podcast before her arrest, she said, and I quote, this is Ruby, it might be five years, 10 years, I might even take it to the grave with me, my dirty little secret. So it appears I don't have any outcomes and I get away with it. She was speaking hypothetically, putting herself in the position of a person who is harboring a secret. Two days later, she was arrested. They posted the 27-minute podcast Wednesday. It discussed the topics of what it means to be a victim and the idea of dishonesty. Frankie later said, I could be dishonest, and I think I'm getting away with it because nobody knows. Suspicion surrounding Frankie's allegedly abusive parenting has long been discussed among their followers and armchair investigators online. Okay. Just trying to see if there's anything else. Here we go. Um... Okay. So. Shoot. What the heck? If the quality of women are wrong. Okay, that's my video but this is where i need to be over here you are unavailable consider the philippines filipino women actually respect that's an ad playing on my video which i can't get to stop it'll stop in a minute i don't know why they have a filipino video uh women getting women on a ruby frankie video but I can't shut it off, so we have to uh, we work harder than ever. Come on. What the freak here? Okay. Now I lost the live stream. Okay, we'll go back in. Here you go back in here all right so any other questions on that stuff i think what i'm going to do is take hey there hey there you're rock star that's great um let me just go into my files here for a second Okay. And let's see. So I wanted to show you something. 
Come on. Open. Just open the, the picture. Okay, so this is a picture. And there's all these notebooks over here. So what I want something truth vinegar. This is like vinegar. So what I want. Okay, and oopsie. That's the whole way. Okay, let's look at I want the truth. All right. And we saw the hallway, then we saw this gross uh I don't know what this was in there. It's like beans, some chicken, maybe it's beans and chicken. And then we have this bedroom, which under here, this looks like a money bag, right? Look more notebooks under there. That's rope and a carabiner. Over there we have uh, books, curriculum, looks like a diaper bag, a ball. Then we have the bedding over there, this pink sheet. And this is the trampoline that's over there. And the trampoline that he was jumping on over here is that white spot. There's a fly swatter. There's towels there. Right. Have to dress wounds. Let's say a cell phone uh, battery bank. Fly swatter. Q-tips on the floor. Ice something freezer. Oh, with ice cream thing. CDs. What does that say? Hildebrandt Family Album. SL something years. 2001, 2002. Slides here. Interesting, Jody. Interesting. Kettlebells. Lots of boxes here, whatever these were. Made in China. DVD. DVD.
Huh. Let's see here. There's the evidence bags they had, and they just JW7, JW9. That's the closet where the little girl was. See how the molding was taken off the bottom? Like, what was that about? Why was that taken off? Did they have, what was going on here? Why was the furniture all cut? Like, what was going on? Of debris there. Eucerin intensive repair lotion, a blood pressure machine, plastic wrap, surgical sponges. Surgical sponges. So like clips, elastic bandages, elastic bandages, castor oil. Castor oil. Get the clothes just up on those floating shelves. Serenity. Aren't those like, what is serenity? Isn't it that for urinary incontinence or something? Is that for Jody or uh, Ruby? this perceptions motives and agendas connections perceptions motives and agendas these are all the DVDs that's that's what those boxes were all those DVDs of her connections and then she's got a bra in here and the rope Great value, safe and strong toilet paper. There's no, there's no um, sound here, but somebody wanted to see the opening of the safe room. This is the opening of the safe room. You know what? That that doesn't even look like very secure, does it? It looks like a like a faker version, right? It's not like a bank fault, right? That little thing on the outside of the door looks like you could just break that off, it because it it just looks ridiculous, doesn't it?
Oh, he's thinking if there's someone behind there. Come on, you really think there's someone behind there? But he can't pull that refrigerator out. Look at that guy, he's scared to death to open the door. Again, no gloves. Absolutely nothing in there. Absolutely nothing. Nothing in there. Absolutely, truly nothing. There's fingerprints all over those um, cabinets. I think I remember somebody talking about that. The fingerprints on those cabinets up top right there. Ridiculous. There's nothing there, guys. And they, they didn't even check the cabinets over the bed of all the things, right? A lot of laughing and carrying around, you know? Kind of a dire situation, yeah. But knowing that they're supposed to be professional and that they know they're on police body cam, I think they would just tone it down a little bit. Okay. So, let's see here. See if we are. They do, yes, they found handcuffs and rope in one of the drawers. That's taken in the evidence side. We've seen that already. But what I'm trying to say is they're just a little bit. Hi, Kate O, how are you? Hello, heart made wise. Hello, burnt popcorn. Judy gave Ruby to be a full line. Well, she could give her permission, but Ruby had it in her to do that. I don't think Ruby needed um, too much coaxing with that, okay? Uh, I think that that's who she really was, right? Okay. Okay, let me go to
Okay, so the Utah Bo Board of Pardons and Parole is overseeing the length of the prison sentence now for Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frankie. On February 20th, 2024, Judge John J. Walton of Utah's 5th Judicial District Court sentenced Ms. Frankie and Ms. Hildebrandt to serve 4 to 30 years in the Utah State Prison, the maximum sentence for this type of offense. Because of Utah's indeterminate sentencing laws, the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole now oversees the length of their prison sentence. Okay. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Watch that, didn't we? Hold on, I want to see something. We watch this one. I'm sure we did. Hmm. I should have saw that one too. Let me see one thing over here. Child abuse. Sure we saw this one. So let me make sure we saw. I don't know. Let me see. There's no sound yet. It might just be another view of another officer. if we saw this view because I don't remember this what's he doing checking his watch right now come on I don't think I, we saw this view from whichever officer this is from I just don't remember this one they have sound on oh, I don't think we saw this one because we right away they kept us out with Jody so those rugs were rolled up prior to them coming in I thought they might have put those rugs like that so they wouldn't be stepping on them but they were already up like that. I know that we did not see this one. This angle of this, whichever officer's body cam this is, we did not see 
this one. And there is no sound right now. I don't know if there will be sound. Let's go ahead a little bit off this officer's arm. If he's just going to stand here. Well, he does give us a little bit of a different view, so let's see. No, we did not see this part of it. That's when she said they walked in with the machine guns. Now, haven't they <laughs> find the little girl in the closet yet? Little girl is up there, guys. The boat. We definitely didn't see this part. I see the double bubble. Hmm. And past her again.
pack back in. Hi guys. Hi guys. Right. Okay. Now there's that guy that we saw before, so Stanley Cup, isn't that interesting? All right, so let me see if there's anything else besides this. Let's see. Okay, um, so that was that child abuse. This one, I think we, that was, uh, these are all three minutes, six minutes. Um, Okay, so stop that now for a minute. And I think, let me just take a look at something over here. I just want to talk about something here. A couple of things I wanted to talk about other than just this right now. Uh, you might get upset. You've got a package that's you're expecting and you're upset. Um, when you take it to this extreme, as this man right here, he was arrested on Monday because he jumped over a post office counter and he beat up a postal employee and he beat that person up so bad they lost consciousness. And it was all because his package had not been delivered. <clears throat> Susquehanna Regional Police Officers were called to the Marietta Post Office 
just before 1 p.m. because there was a postal worker lying behind the counter bleeding. They came in, found the victim dazed, confused, and he said that the suspect jumped over the counter and punched them in the face several times, knocking them unconscious. Suspect was angry because he did not receive a package that he thought he should have received by now. Now, I want you to look at that man and tell me how old you think that that man is right there. I want everybody to tell me how old that man is on the screen right there. How old is that man? Just put it put put a number up in the chat, please, and tell me how old you think that man is. I'm trying to get to the live. Please tell me how old you think he is. Forty-three, forty-two, thirty-five, fifty. Okay. The source that I'm reading from lists 60, 38, 37. The source that I'm reading from lists this suspect's age as 27. Do you think something's wrong? Okay. They list this suspect's age as 27. I don't think that's correct. Um, not at all. Just saying, I don't think that's correct. Okay, hang on, I know that you've got a black screen. I'm trying to get back up here. Okay. So, and I'll close that because we don't need that and we don't need this. All right. This is James Moore. He was still on the scene when the officers arrived and he was arrested without incident. Court records show that he was still in jail on Tuesday after he did not come up with the $200,000 bail. So let's look at this uh, guy, okay? So you're really, really upset your package didn't come. So your idea is to let me jump over the counter and pummel the postal worker. And let's see how well that worked out for you. So maybe your package would have been delivered the next day, but you're now in jail. And now you're gonna go through a heap of legal stuff. You're gonna be tied up in the courts. You have a $200,000 bond on you. You have a criminal record now. You're probably gonna be serving some jail time. For what reason that you've got to get a hold of yourself? This is crazy. He's charged with aggravated assault. Unbelievable. But then there was another Pennsylvania man that put on a scream costume and killed his neighbor. His neighbor. Why did I say that? Um, Oh, wow. What's going on? Prince Harry's in some big trouble, huh? What the heck is going on? Oh, 
Okay, so hang on a second here. So there's some update on Sebastian Rogers. We know the little boy that's been uh, missing here for weeks now, I believe it is. Let's see. So his mother and the stepmother say they have no idea where 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers could be as the search enters its fourth week. Sebastian last seen on February 26th at the family home in Sumner County. TBI, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, issued an Amber Alert on February 27th. Now, Chris Proudfoot said he was almost four hours away in Memphis working on a construction project at St. Jude when Sebastian disappeared on or about 6.20 a.m. He contacted 911 after his wife and the teenager's mother, Katie Proudfoot, told him Sebastian was missing. There were no signs of forced entry and nothing was missing from the home. The Proudfoots do not have an alarm or any cameras. Katie Proudfoot said the only thing she heard the night before was a thud coming from his room and Sebastian telling her that he was okay shortly afterwards. There were no family altercations at the time. Now, Grace questioned Chris Proudfoot regarding a spanking incident he discussed during a YouTube live stream. Sebastian got caught lying. I gave him a swat with a belt on his buttocks on the outside of his clothes. One swat, and that happened several years ago, one and only one time. Chris said, despite the purported rumors, the incident did not turn into a CPS service call. The couple said that for now they have left the family home with Chris returning to work and Katie saying she would be going with him. She doesn't know when she will return and said that part of the reason for her leaving is harassment from the public. Chris has not taken a polygraph test and said law enforcement told him that he didn't need to take one. Chris said that the investigators have cleared both him and his wife of foul play at least three dogs hit on a retention pond near the home. Law enforcement drained the pond and found no evidence. Sebastian is described as a white male, 5'5", 106 to 108 pounds. He has dirty blonde hair and was last seen wearing a black sweatshirt, black sweatpants. His flashlight keychain is unaccounted for. I don't know. There's, he's like without a trace there, yeah? Yeah, I don't know. But there was some other stuff now about hmm. I wanted to tell you about that scream guy. Edward, here we go, Edward, what is his, Whitehead Jr. Let's get a picture of Edward Whitehead Jr. up here. This is a crazy thing. I mean, I saw this early this morning.
Okay, here he is. Let me tell you about what happened here. Hold on, I've got to close some of these windows. I've just got too many windows open here and it's too confusing. Okay. So he dressed up in a scream costume and he killed his neighbor. And then he went back home to watch a movie. I'm sorry. Now, I've got this wrong, okay? This is Zach Russell Moyer. His neighbor that he killed is Edward Whitehead Jr. Sorry. Edward Whitehead Jr. is the neighbor that was killed. He was 59. This is Zach Russell Moyer, 30. Let's make that clear. The neighbor was the one killed, Edward Whitehead Jr. The reason that Zach Russell Moyer, 30 years old, that you see here, intended to kill his neighbor is because he believed that the neighbor, Edward Whitehead Jr., 59, committed crimes that he wanted to kill him for. Moyer is charged with one count of homicide. He was sent to the Carbon County Jail without bail. Police went to the house at about 3.30 p.m. on Monday, and there was a report of an assault. Whitehead was hit with a knife and a chainsaw. So this guy dressed in a scream costume with a knife and a chainsaw killed his neighbor. He was brought to St. Luke's Hospital, the neighbor where he died of his injuries. Investigators searched surveillance footage. They saw a man dressed in a scream costume enter the rear of Whitehead's home. After canvassing the area, police tracked that person down, later identified as Moyer, to his home. Moyer told officials that he believed... Hold on a moment, this something keeps popping up here. Get out of here. That Whitehead was behind some recent crimes, and he was going to take care of this. He was going to take the law into his own hands, and he killed Whitehead. Moyer told police he went home. He went in the home. He just wanted to scare Whitehead. He went there with a knife and a small chainsaw. It wasn't a large chainsaw. It was not a big saw. It was a small chainsaw. When questioned again, Moyer said, no, no, I went there to kill him because of the crimes that I believe he committed. He told police that he stabbed Whitehead with a knife and then he went home and he hid the chainsaw and the knife. He watched a movie until the authorities arrived. He was arraigned Tuesday morning. He did not have an attorney listed for him. So that is just strange. Okay. I don't know what crimes he thought that he committed or what happened there, but yeah, scream costume. Yep. And it keeps getting more odd with this Texas A&M student that vanishes while waiting on an Uber Eats order, right? Nobody knows what's going on with where he is, how these people are just vanishing into thin air, right? So the family of the Texas A&M student, Caleb Harris, is pleading for answers. They don't know where he is after he stepped outside briefly to pick up his Uber Eats order. The 21-year-old vanished on March 4th from his residence on the cottages in Corpus Christi. It was a little before 3 a.m. in the 1900 block of Ennis, Jocelyn. Now, his father is Randy Harris, and he spoke with Nancy Grace 
and he said that everything seemed normal with his son and there were no issues to indicate that he was in any trouble or that, you know, left willingly. He stepped outside his apartment about 2.44 a.m. without his keys, without his shoes. He sent a Snapchat to his sister. He then made an Uber food order about a minute later. 3.03 a.m., Caleb sent a Snapchat to his best friend at a bridge next to his apartment complex, and then his phone either died or was turned off. When someone seemingly walks away into the fog, we wonder why. That's not what happened here. He didn't just walk away, Nancy Grace said. Look at this guy. No sign ever of depression, any emotional problems. He did not disappear on his own. The food arrived at the apartment at 3.20, but the order was still there. The following morning, Caleb's two roommates contacted police around 11 a.m. Food order was delivered at 3.20. The Uber driver, identified as a female driver, was questioned and cleared. It's hard. We're a family of faith, and that's where our strength comes from. I cry a lot, but my wife is my rock. My daughter is my rock. My in-laws, my family, my church. We feel the love, the love of Christ just radiating, giving us the adrenaline, really, just to keep going. Harris is described as a white male, 5'11", 180 pounds, brown hair and brown eyes. He doesn't have his wallet or vehicle with him. There is currently a $25,000 reward for information that leads to the safe return of Caleb. Let's hope that it ends better than Riley Strain, right? Oh my gosh, this is getting too much. Where's he's found alive and well? This is crazy. Okay, so let's talk about this. Prince Harry is dragged into the $30 million lawsuit against Sean Diddy Combs over S-trafficking parties. The Duke of Sussex and other celebrities boasted his legitimacy as the mansions are raided, but his name appears in U.S. court documents related to a $30 million lawsuit claiming that Sean Diddy Combs is an S abuser of men and women record producer Rodney Lil Ra Jones filed the bombshell lawsuit against Sean Diddy Combs and claims that his affiliation to the Duke of Sussex and the other stars gave him and his associates legitimacy. The court documents that were filed last month do not suggest any wrongdoing on Prince Harry's part. He is not a defendant and is named once in the 73-page document. Here we have picture. Come on. Oh my goodness, this is ridiculous, isn't it? Okay, let's put this picture over here, please. That's Kanye West, Harry, and Sean Diddy Combs. Uh, again, behind him is uh, William, right? 
So let's see what's going on over here. That was at a concert for Diana in July of 2007. So 17 years ago, almost coming upon 17 years ago. Harry is named on page 63 of the $30 million lawsuit. Oh, the producer alleges Combs boasted of having shot people and threatened to inflict bodily harm if Jones did not comply with his demands. Perhaps the most disturbing claims are that Combs allegedly forced a 19-year-old woman, Ms. Ventura, to take part in drug-fueled parties where she was having intimate relations with male, males for hire, let's say that, while wearing masquerade masks as it was filmed And um, as it was filmed by him while he did something to himself, okay? The lawsuit states that Ms. Ventura was repulsed by Mr. Combs' demands, but between physical beating and recognizing his incredible power and temper, she became petrified of him and felt she could not say no. In another incident, an enraged Combs dangled Ms. Ventura's friend over a 17th floor hotel balcony. He also threatened to blow up the car of a love rival, Kid Cuddy, which later exploded on his driveway, though it's unclear who's responsible. In September of 2018, after Ms. Ventura tried to break things off, Sean Combs allegedly forced his way into her home and forcefully essayed her. Here. Little Rod, according to Diddy, is nothing more than a liar who filed a $30 billion lawsuit shamelessly looking for an undeserved payday, said his attorney. While Harry is not facing a legal claim, it is not the first time the royals have been embroiled in serious court allegations. You remember when Prince Andrew was forced to settle a lawsuit brought by Virginia Giffrey, who was in that Jeffrey Epstein scandal, right? Prince William and Prince Harry met P. Diddy and Kanye at a post-concert party the princess hosted to thank all who took part. The princess contact, oh, excuse me. The princess hosted to thank all who took part in the concert for Diana at Wembley Stadium in 2007. However, the Prince of Wales is not named in the court documents. It's not known how many times Harry has met the rapper since then, if at all. So why is he named in there? Let's see.
anyway. Hold on a minute, I'm trying to get to the, I'm gonna to try to get rid of some more stuff that's open. Hold on, I have my task manager. I'm just gonna get rid of a bunch of stuff here. It's a little bit too much, okay? Hang in there, guys. I'd say this is probably um, oh brother hang on I'm ending a bunch of tasks hopefully it'll end soon anyway it is let me see here Come on, guys. Alrighty. Hopefully, come on, let me get back onto the live, please. There we go. Hopefully, it's going to let me back into. See, you guys, I can't get these stupid pictures off here. Come on. All of them, I mean, some of them are ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so now it's going to say live streaming. Yes, let's wait for the live streaming YouTube to come back. But um, I'm going to have to go to the doctor tomorrow. I wanted to get some stuff sent out. I thought I'd come back and do that, but then I ended up coming back. And what was I doing? Oh, I had to try to hook up another thing. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you to all of our... New people that are here are longtime ramblers. Uh, you're all appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to go to the doctor. Hi, Jeanette, tomorrow. Good thoughts, please, if you would like to send some good thoughts and prayers because I'm just worried about a lot of different things and I've got quite a few appointments coming up in the next couple of weeks. So would appreciate that and uh, good thoughts and prayers for all of our ramblers going through stuff. Sharon and everyone else, uh, Native Libra and everybody. Now, um, I think we should play, hi, Mr. Electric, how are you? How's it going? What did Mr. Electric say something? Mr. Electric, what did you say? Mr. Electric said something that I wanted to read get used to the idea that Diddy was the money end of what happened to Tupac. That's, yeah, that's what I hear about stuff like that. Word cookies. Yeah, we're going to play word cookies before we go. Oh, you're welcome, Sandra. I hope that you enjoyed it. We're not going to have our auction tomorrow. We're going to have it Thursday. So everybody mark that down. We're going to have it Thursday because I have to be on the road Maybe I'll check in from the road. Maybe I'll do a drive. I know how much you guys like that uh, from the road. We'll see. We'll see how it goes tomorrow. 
Hey Emmy, how are you? So this is if you're brand new to the channel and you see all the crime and stuff we cover, we try to do a little bit of word cookies at the end, at least the daily puzzle, because it kind of gets us to wind down a little bit, gets our brains working in another direction, and it's just some um, a little bit of a release, okay? Okay, let's see. I did it all by myself. Okay, let's play maybe one. Let's play maybe one before we go. Finish this one if we can. Glory. Okay, glory. How about glory? How about Tori? No, that's not going to be there. Be an extra word. Um, How about riot? I'm just gonna say riot before. Yay! Oh, I'm so close to an advancement. I don't know, we'll see.
Okay, let's see. How about... What is this one? You're good, Mommy. Thank you, Sandra. I try to be, but sometimes like I... How's Painted Black doing? Tell her we miss her. Is it netting? Marco, where are you? What are you doing? Why am I in top chat instead of live chat? Oh, I hate this. All right, well, tomorrow's another day. <laughs> we'll get it then. Um, anyway, I will see you guys tomorrow. I'll try to shop in. Maybe I'll stop in from the road. I don't know. We'll see how the, what tomorrow brings. All right, and I love you guys. God bless. Prayers. We'll see you tomorrow. Be good. Be nice. Love you guys. Bye, Judy. Deanne, I don't... I'll try that, but I don't think... Nope. Okay. All right, we'll see you later. Bye. A-N-N-E-X-E. -N -N -E. Let's see. Yay, okay. Very good. Thank you, Margo. All right. We'll do our big advancement maybe tomorrow, okay? Let's see if I got any rewards here. Anything free? No, nothing. I already got it. All right. See you tomorrow. Everybody be good. Love you guys. God bless. Prayers.